A few weeks before assuming his new role as Miami's chief of police, I got the opportunity to speak with Arturo Acevedo. We talked about everything from the importance of diversifying all police forces across the country to being Austin, Texas's first Latino chief, his advice for fellow officers patrolling the streets during such violent times, to the current mistrust of the police and the importance of transparency on the job. So why did this nationally celebrated chief, beloved in Houston, where he last served, get booted from his job in Miami only six months on the job? Being Cuban-born, son of an exiled police officer, growing up in California and now moving to America's most Cuban city, it felt like a coming home. El jefe perfecto for Miami. Chief Acevedo was the man hired to lead Miami. He successfully led a force of 5,220 officers in Houston, the fourth largest city in the country. So how challenging would it be for a Cuban son to preside over 1,371 officers in Miami? Muy difícil. Before he could put down his cafecito cubano, there was already controversy over his hiring and his salary. And soon, this chief, who understands that when you stand for something, you put yourself at risk, was facing off with the city of Miami commissioners, accusing them of interfering with police investigations, pointing out discrepancies and accusing them of corruption and running the city like a Cuban mafia. This quickly led to his public character assassination playing out on live television. Here's a little of what went down. Okay. This is uh, Chief Acevedo. I, I don't know what it's all about. Probably another fundraiser, I don't know, or, you know, something that was going on in, in Austin. Do you find it acceptable for your police chief? Not that he was dressed up as Elvis, not that he was trying to pretend that uh, he looked like Elvis, not that he was trying to mimic uh, Elvis singing, but that he would go out publicly with pants like that, man in that fashion, where his midsection are in pants so tight like this. Is, is this something that you believe uh, is appropriate for a police chief? And you don't have to answer this if you don't like, Mr. Manager. But I, I'm just going through parts to show what goes on through this man's head. As he himself told me, first impressions are last impressions and bad impressions are hard to change. Months after this interview with Chief Acevedo, a few city commissioners got their way with removing him from his job. But that wasn't enough, though. And to add insult to injury, one of them felt it necessary to ruin Chief Acevedo's replacement, Chief Morales' welcome speech, by playing a familiar mafia soundtrack as he gave his remarks. Definitely not ideal conditions, but I, I, I'm, I'm honored and humble. I have been a, a servant of the city of Miami. Oh! <laughs> I've been a, a, a humble servant of the, the city of Miami for 28 years, and I look forward to the next chapter. Um, I look forward to getting to know the residents, the visitors, and, and the administration on a deeper level. Um, and. Uh, like I said, I, I, I welcome um, everyone in the city uh, to share their thoughts. Welcome. This is Hola, My Name Is, the podcast with Arturo Acevedo. Hola, my name is. Hola, my name is. Hola, my name is. My name is. My name is. My name is. Dedicated to public service since 1987, he's a career police officer, California, the state of Texas. Let's go. Let's not, you're screwed it up. I'm discounting a year. I'm <laughs> Are we live here or what? We're making you. I, you made yourself. You're aging yourself, Chief. I want to age. I gave you a discount of a year. I know, I know, but I don't. Look, uh, uh, facts matter. I know that. Absolutely. You know, and the fake media doesn't matter, but we try to be factual. Right? Now more than ever, facts Absolutely. matter. The truth matters. Yes, it does. Being real matters. Yes. Being Absolutely. human matters. Yes. And that's you. These are all your qualities, Chief. Oh Lord, thank you. Huh? I think I think that people know when they when they see me, they, they're going to get. There's no, there's no hiding here. It's just sort of me, mom, the same guy behind closed doors as I am in public. And uh, I think that's important. People need to know your heart, especially as a leader. 
Uh, and this was interesting is I got recorded once by my command staff when I was chewing them out in Houston, <laughs> in, in Austin, excuse me, after uh, an incident involving an African-American young woman. Um, and uh, I was just livid at them. And some one of my commanders recorded me and then gave it to the media. It was like... Like well, being sneaky about it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the media was To like, do harm. To do harm. And what they didn't do, what they didn't get is that people's reaction was, holy cow, he's the same guy behind closed doors as he is in, in, in front of the public. So uh, you, you, you get what you see. And, uh, has, that, has that cost you? Being honest, being transparent, saying what you got to say, saying what you, what you feel? Yeah, I mean, look, when, when you don't stand for anything, you stand for it. When you stand for something, you put yourself at risk. And I think that leadership is about putting yourself at risk for the greater good. And, uh, you know, I came to Texas from California, which immediately the uh, assumption is you must be a, a left, you know, in Texas, you know, it's a conservative state like Florida. And, uh, you must be one of those crazy uh, wingnut liberals from California. And, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a center of the road kind of guy because I think that we need to be practical in life and pragmatic in life. And, and we've lost that in this country. And I think that as a result, we've seen a lot of uh, division and a lot of conflict. And that's not good. Now, you, are, you never shy away from giving your opinion. <laughs> I'm Cuban, man. Come on. <laughs> I mean, that's in the Constitution when you're born as a Cuban. This comes in your DNA. Claro, claro. Y gracias claro. a Papi también, there was a police officer in Cuba. Yeah, my dad was a cop. Our dad, my, uh, my uh, under, I think it was my thing, was the president when he was the, a cop. And, uh, and, you know, as a little boy, you know, let's face it, it's all about politics when you're listening. I used to put my two cents in, in every conversation. My <laughs> bagaya de muchacho. You know, this is not for, this is an adult conversation, but I understand it. Now you should tell him, hey man, if we all stayed in, in Cuba, yeah. had we all stayed, Castro would have been gone a long time ago. Wow. But we all left. Yeah. My cameraman. Is this in English or Spanish? It's Spanglish. Hola, my name is. My podcast is for everybody, Latinos in the United States. And we live in both worlds. So that's why it's okay. We live, you know. I was born in Chicago yeah. and, and um, born to Cuban parents, as you know, yeah. but I, I, I live in both worlds. So I speak in English. I speak Spanish. When I, think it's, when I speak in Spanish, I'm thinking in English. I don't know if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, right now, I don't know what I'm thinking. <laughs> I'm not thinking much about I've been here. But the truth of the matter is that Latinos are very important to uh, the history of this nation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether it's from uh, uh, Mexico, Central and South America. Uh, at Caribe, the Caribbean, we have made a tremendous and have had a tremendous impact. And I think some of the conflict we're facing as a nation is that the Anglo population is nervous that uh, we're quickly becoming a minority majority a nation. And what I try to tell here in Miami, <laughs> having been the first Latino chief in or Hispano at the Austin Police Department, the first police chief in their history that was uh, from Hispanic uh, descent or Latin descent. And the, and the, and the fourth largest and city Houston, in the United and States, and the Houston. One Houston. I was the first Hispanic again. Mm -hmm. And so I keep telling my folks, let's not forget what it was like when we were the minority. Uh, because in Miami, it's almost like you got to keep an eye on the Cubans, make sure we're giving other people opportunities. Right. We want to be inclusive and we should never forget the journey that our parents took, that we took, that I took as a young immigrant. And we don't want to, as we become a majority, uh, we want to make sure that we're inclusive, that we respect people that may not look like us, and that we never forget where we came from. I think too many people do. Unfortunately. Let's talk about that, because when your parents exiled to the United States, they went to California. Yeah. California is very different, like we just spoke yeah. a little bit about, you know, from Florida or from Texas also, where, mm -hmm. where, where you ran two very big police uh, departments also. What's, what's different, right, from 1986 when you started your career in law enforcement to now, 2021? Well, first of all, let's just, you know, let's be real honest. Right now we're living at a time when law enforcement is, uh, you know, we are being absolutely ostracized, there's a false narrative that law enforcement is broken, which is absolutely wrong. It's just, it's, it really truly is false. You know, law, is law enforcement perfect? No. The human condition is not perfect. So the human condition is not perfect. How do you expect law enforcement to be perfect? We don't, we don't grow police officers on Petri dishes. Right. They come from society. But law enforcement, I would argue, in the last 35 years has come a long way. And I would argue that we've come much further than society. You know, it's like uh, when some of the media criticizes law enforcement about 
issues of race, go to their boardrooms, go to their newsrooms, go to where the decision makers are, the business side of media. They don't have the diversity in many places to this day that we have in law enforcement. You know, we we have we we've had a zero tolerance on sexual harassment for 25, 30 years. I can just go on down. You know, Fox News. You know, mm -hmm. conservative. We know how they were treating women there. It was like chattel, right? They were property. Yeah. So our greatest critics sometimes they need to be looking in the mirror because uh, life's about points of reference. You can't appreciate what's in front of you or truly assess what's in front of you unless you have something to compare it to. Right. Well, I've got a 35-year journey. When I joined the California Highway Patrol, CHP, uh, I used to joke uh, that I thought I joined the uh, Cuban Highway Patrol, CHP, or the Chicano Highway Patrol, CHP. But at the time, you know, there were over 90 captains in California with the CHP, and two were minorities. One was black, one was Latino. That was 1986. Blacks and Latinos were... We uh, safe to say very underrepresented. Then. Underrepresented, underrepresented. And so I said, help me, this Caucasian Highway Patrol. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, but, you know, as a result of the struggles of others mm -hmm. uh, that, that fought the fight, you know, opportunities came about and I ended up promoting up the, the ranks. And, you know, and here we are, uh, 35 years later in Miami, one of the hottest cities, if not the, the yeah. hottest city in the nation. How are you dealing with the humidity? I'm from Texas, right? Texas more humid than Florida? Humidity is humidity. But what's interesting about humidity is that your body, uh, you get acclimated. You yeah. Know, and I, the first, I got to Texas in 2007. I remember there's something called Juneteenth. All right. You know what Juneteenth is? Well, when you're from California, you've never heard of Juneteenth, but I find out. A lot of, well, as a matter of fact, a lot of people learn what Juneteenth was just last year because of, you know, the, the social, uh, you know, yep. un unrest. Yeah. We learned a lot last year, and we'll get into that in a minute. Yep. But Because, you know, Juneteenth is the, two. it took two years for the Emancipation Proclamation for the African American community to mm -hmm. know about it. Mm -hmm. So I'm in Austin. They, my, I was announced as the new chief after a very crazy search on the 14th of June, on the, tw on the uh, and I remember that. I had to come back on the from California on the on the twenty first to be confirmed by the council, and I learned about Juneteenth. So I tell my I tell the city manager I used to call her Oz. She's a a, a woman by the name of Toby Futrell. Uh, she started as an office assistant, the lowest uh, you know entry level position in the city. You talking about beautiful story? Worked her way up all the way up to city manager in Austin, one of the hottest cities in the country. And I said, hey, you know what? I heard about this Juneteenth parade. Uh, I've never heard of it. But I think it's important for me as the guy you just elected to be at that parade even before they confirm me, before I get there. You party. invited yourself. I invited myself. And I walked, and I don't believe in sitting in a car because I like working the crowd. And boy, let me tell you, I learned about humidity. Why did you think it, why did you think it was important for you to invite yourself and be there? Because it sends an important message, right? I think uh, I tell my team here, and I've always told my people as a first impressions are lasting impressions. First impressions, are hard to change yep so you better work your ass off to make sure people have the right impression and so uh i i started i'm there in my just uh in my slacks and a polo shirt then de decided to walk the route it was about a two and a half three mile route in june on june 19th of 2007. i've never been a guy that sweats by the time i was done with that parade i sweated through and through, my shirt, my pants, my underwear, my socks, I mean, I was drenched. <laughs> but, you know, within within a year or two, your body acclimates. Acclimates. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, the, the humidity is fine. But look at all this water around us, right? <laughs> I mean, we get that nice breeze. I, I love Miami. It is. You guys don't have, have to get rid of me. You're going to have to, like, uh, kidnap me and put me on our wild side. <laughs> Maybe he saved his wild side. You can send me back to, you know, the, the, to Belize or something. <laughs> Hola, my name, is, my, name is, my name is. Jefe, tú te has destacado también por tu sentido eh, de humor. For yeah. your, uh, you, you have a great sense of humor. But you have, and hu humor has a great way of bringing people together and yeah. healing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it's, but it's very difficult to do because not everybody gets the jokes. Not everybody sees the humor in, in, in the jokes. But that's been key always of your personality and your leadership style. I believe that if, if I had, if that's me for my sense of humor, I would have died of cancer a long time ago. When you think about the things that you deal in this profession. You know, the people they've had to bury, uh, the cops I've had to bury, which it, it would kill you. Uh, you know, my last 11 months in uh, Houston, I had to, uh, we had to bury five officers. Three were shot and killed. One died in a helicopter crash and, uh, and one died of COVID. And 
if you didn't hear you, what, look, as Cubans, you saw, yeah. the funniest people would, under communist rule, or yeah. you know, you have you you have you have nothing else but your humor. Right. And I think that laughter, music, are are really feed the soul. Yeah. So uh, there's plenty of time to be serious. So we we have fun, and that's the first order of business I told Kenya over here. Chief, you talked about the officers that you had to, you know, bury and say goodbye to, and many uh, fellow officers have become, uh, it becomes family. Um, and we're living in a very difficult uh, time where there's a lot of, uh, even more, not just animosity, but hate, yeah. and people form a quick opinion on a couple second, a video that they see online, and they're quick to judge and criticize, and even uh, publicly on social media, um, I would say even indict. Yeah. police officers on the moment with their comments yeah. uh right that's how hurtful is that to you when you know uh that police officers don't wake up every day and put the uniform on and say i'm gonna go out and kill somebody yeah. that's not a decision that's taken lightly that's not a decision that police officers want to make how does that feel for you uh when when people are are critical of of the uniform well i mean look when it's legitimate i'm good to go uh but people have just they just have a warped sense of Reality, man. I mean, look at this uh, young woman that was shot and killed uh, last month. She she had already stabbed a young, another young girl. She's fifteen year old young woman. She was uh, getting ready to stab another girl, and the officer shot and killed her. In the officer's presence, she knew the officer yeah. was there. They announced their presence, and she was still attacking, knife in her hand. Yes, and you know, it is a tremendous tragedy that this beautiful young life was taken, this this soul that was, for whatever reason, was this tortured soul there. And you know what's even more tragic? Is that rather than try to focus on what, what failed, the system, mm -hmm. society, you know, how did we fail this young woman that ended up losing her life? Rather than trying to figure out how do we do better with mental health, uh, emotional health, or maybe substance abuse, maybe whatever it may be. How do we wrap ourselves around a society of similarly situated young girls or young people so they don't end up having to have a police officer having to shoot them because they're about to stab? And then, and, and, and then instead of focusing on that, it's all about the cop killed them, the cop yeah. murdered them. What a piece of work. Had that officer not taken that, made that split second decision and that she would have killed that little girl, then it would be another conversation. So the officer was in a no one situation. I can assure It was the officer's duty to interview. They had no, he, had, he was not given another option. You, uh, do you have any kids? I don't. Okay. I have my dog. But, well, he's like a kid. Well, he's probably a spoiled kid. Kind of like Ken. <laughs> he's a neat. <laughs> but let me ask you this. You have a niece and nephew. I do. And godchildren, yes. And godchildren. Imagine that being your godchild. Yeah. And the officer didn't take the shot and then you've got shot right you, you, it's you, almost damn if you do damn if you don't for police officers right now it, it, it police is. officers losing protection like what's happening in, in new york a lot of police officers put the uniform on they go to calls every day let's let's be frank are scared yeah well, many qualified immunity it's uh, what do you tell police officers that are doing the job today yeah. that do so scared okay, first of all look <laughs> know the law no policy and Keep your skills up, because if you wrap yourself, if you know the law and you know policy, and you wrap yourself around it, it doesn't matter what people think, and you conduct yourself in accordance with the law and the policy. It doesn't matter what people think. You will, you will, you will be just fine. Uh, and then the other thing that that, that that I tell them is, como mi mamá me dijo, homie, okay, <laughs> you know, you know that uh, you're you know that your life matters. So if you're more worried about consequences than surviving a, a, a true conflict. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm tough on bad cops. I mean, I don't know if you've already heard around here. I've told my cops, if you lie, mm -hmm. you die. If, go ask any cop, Ryan. That's already around. Uh, but at the same time, we're not going to sell them. Out. And I, I tell them, if you wrap yourself around those, you do the right thing. Uh, if you take a life and it's justified, we're going to support you and the community supports you. And let's be real honest, the very vast majority of people still support law enforcement. Thank God. Even our greatest critics will say, you know, uh, I don't like the police, but this officer that I know, and so what they're doing is they're using broad brushes to paint right. the profession based on the knuckle draggers, right? And let's face it, no, no profession is more scrutinized than law enforcement. Yep. 
Okay, we have it over a thousand fatal shootings a year across the country, and that's with tens of millions of contacts. Less than one percent of con of arrests lead to use of force. I mean, it's minuscule. Mm -hmm. But uh, the sad truth is, this is the other sad truth that we have to acknowledge: is when bad policing occurs, bad policing right. occurs, it disproportionately impacts communities of color and poor communities, to include poor white communities, right? Because people don't talk about poor white people in this country. I'm talking about your traditional American poor whites. The American dream has left a lot of uh, second, third, fourth generation Americans behind. Mm -hmm. Nobody talks about them. Why so? Why do you think that is? Uh, because we are we, we talk about race relations and we talk about the injustices uh, uh, in terms of systemic racism, things of that nature. But we also have to talk about uh, the American dream and how many people it's leaving behind. And if we don't speak to everyone. And again, be inclusive of everyone. I think this if this is the, the pie of opportunity here, there's enough pie for everybody. And our job, I think, as leaders is to help everybody navigate life so they can have an equal opportunity. Uh, we don't need to talk about affirmative action. We need to, we need to talk about equal opportunity. And, and here in Miami, I go, that includes... My poor Agrenguito, like, it'll be okay, mijo. We're, we're going to take care of you here. We're going to give everybody a chance. Last year, when you were uh, still uh, police chief in the city of Houston, yeah. during the social unrest, um, things were getting out of hand, and you said, no, wait a moment. You went out there, and you locked hands with yeah. the protesters. Yeah. Um, why did you do that? Well, first of all, empathy is something that's really important. And I think that as a leader, you set the tone. The relationship, you know, I get a lot of haters. Oh, this guy's a media hound, think of a more inappropriate word. Uh, some guy here, local politician, I'm not going to say any names. Is the, is the word whore? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Well, I didn't know this was a family show or not. <laughs> you know, I'm not a uniform, so I said uh, it. Yeah, so so, so they don't understand that, 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 that you set the tone yeah. as a leader. And I, I, I want to live in Miami. Because everybody told oh, this guy wants to run for office. I've been hearing that forever, too, by the way. Do you plan on running for office? Hell no. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm too far to the left for the right. Too far to the right for the left. I couldn't be elected as a dog catcher uh, because I'm focused on good policies, mm -hmm. not on good po politics. Uh, and so what I, what, what I say, I, I went out there because I wanted the community to know that George Floyd may not have been my brother, may not have been my son, may have not been my uncle, may not have been my dad. But he was a member of our community, and his life mattered. And people wanted to be dismissed as some of the haters. Oh, and he was a crook. He did this. He did that. It wasn't about the life he lived. It was about the way he died. And that man should be alive today. And for people to not understand that when black Americans, and maybe Afro-Cubans and Puerto Ricans or whatever, when they saw George Floyd, and I'm spiritual, when a guy starts calling for their mama, dude, to me, he's already seen his mother. I think he was already transitioning, right? And what they don't understand is for the African-American community, when they saw George Floyd, they're begging for his life and asking for his mom. They saw their own loved one. They saw their own neighbor. They saw their own friend. And I think empathy is a wonderful thing that goes a long way. And you know what really hurts me right now, but I'm still transitioning, going back to help my wife pack the house on my son, is how many people in that community come For, the, for the move to Miami, not yeah, because she left yet. Right, no, for the move to Miami. But it right? sounded like, sound no, kind no, of obvious. No, she yeah. packed up and my wife, you know, I just wanted to clarify. No, no she packed up. Así comienzan los rumores. Oh, yeah, no, hey, no. She, <laughs> she told me divorce is not an option. <laughs> Death is not divorce. I go, I know, don't go swimming at night. There's a lot of sharks here in Miami. <laughs> but I've had, I've had people come up to me with tears in the eyes from the African American community. We're so sad to leave. And during those protests, being out there, it, when the cops, I mean, I disappeared one night for four hours. We had about 60,000 protesters by myself. Uh, and my team was not happy with me. They couldn't find me. You were like in the crowd with uh, the people was, that were protesting. I was, I was surrounded. I had stuff thrown and at me. And he had stuff thrown at oh, you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's always the other anarchists that get in the middle right. of this. Uh, Try like the hijack, whatever the right, protest the is. Protest, man. Yeah, and yeah, these are professionals, yeah. right? They know what they're doing. And, uh, and, uh, but when I had guys, these guys that, were, that, 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 you know, not the stereotype, but you can tell that they're pretty hardcore based on the tattoos and stuff. I mean, crying on my shoulder. That touches people's hearts, man. And, and it plants seeds. And I've got some criticism here from the, from the right, these old uh, Cuban politicians that, you know, the bravado. You know, I've gotten criticism because I criticized President Trump when he said you need to nominate the streets. And you know what? Let me tell you something. 
leadership is about, and, and when there's a fire, leadership is about put the fire out, not adding fuel. And uh, and I believe that people will always judge us not just by what we say and do, but also what we fail to say and do. And so I want history to always, as a leader, you don't have to agree with me, but I want history to judge me as a leader based on the fact that oh, not just what I did, but also what I and what I said. But I don't want people to say that, you know what, at Depot de Huerta, and he never said anything. Because people are watching. Yeah, They're always watching what we do. And I'm going to live in Miami, not because I want to run for office, but because how do I convince the people in Miami that I'm invested in this city as their police chief when I don't even live here? I just feel very strongly about that. So, And that's why, you obviously, you've re relocated. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, the end of the city. Hola, my name is. My name is. My name is. Your message to people who mistrust the police. Don't give up on us. We're not giving up on you. Um, you know, I, I really believe to, to, to know each other. I really believe that, again, familiarity breeds trust. You know, go say hi to an officer. Wave at them. And one of the things I always tell my cops, you know, you ever been at a red light? And, uh, you know, I'm going I'm to turn. Yeah, I got my hopes. You're never going to be in front of the camera with that. Except, so I'm like, this. Hey, a red light is a police officer, right? Uh -huh. And I tell my cops, and you know, you can always, with your peripheral vision, you can you can feel somebody looking at you. How many times over the years, all that community man wants to do is be acknowledged, wave, smile, but we'll have cops will do this. What the fuck are you looking at, type of attitude? Mm -hmm. right? Instead of going, hey man, how you doing? Right. That's how people, they want a connection. And I always say a smile is a sign of strength. It's a sign of confidence and it's welcoming. Uh, so I think that through relational policing, which is what we talk about a lot. You hashtag that a lot. A lot. Al it's, on almost all your posts. On almost everything. Because what does that mean so pe for people that don't understand that? Relational well, policing. Policing, look, first, life's about relationships, right? I mean, uh, we are radically, radically dependent as human beings on one another. Whether we want to admit it or not, we are. And every contact we make, whether you're the clerk, you're the PIO, you're the police officer, you're the 911 call taker, is the beginning of a relationship. I talked about first impressions or last impressions are hard to change. And by the way, it may be your only opportunity to make an impression. So I talk about making understanding that every contact is the beginning of a relationship. And our job is to conduct ourselves in a way where we make a friend, not a foe. And so we're going to be, and, it, and it's TREAT is the acronym I came up with. It's about transparency. We're going to try to be transparent be engaging it's about respect respect starts with self-respect you gotta respect your own uniform your own chain of command your own mm -hmm. co-workers and the community it's about engaging you can't build a relationship by hiding in the you know fourth floor of headquarters or right. can't change culture uh via memo you i gotta go out there and engage my community i gotta engage my officers and through the added transparent respectful engagement you start building emotional capital because we know we're going to have a bad shooting we know we're going to have a bad out incident because I, I have yet to find the magic fairy dust that they that somehow these yeah. critics think exists that a police chief can just sprinkle uh -huh. and guarantee. If you find that, please let me know. Yeah, give me the exclusive. Exactly. Give me the exclusive for the interview, oh, chief. Give, are you kidding? If, you, if it when you find it, please give me it's, the exclusive. It's crypto. <laughs> oh, okay, is it? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's the currency. But uh, we're going to engage, build emotional capital. Then we're going to hold people accountable, man. we got to yeah. call balls and strikes. Balls and strikes hold each other accountable. So if we did that, we end up building trust. And trust is a commodity that we need for that critic or that person to feel comfortable. And the only way we're going to do it is we get to know each other. Get out of the car. Go say hi to people. Smile. I, I, look, I, I still go out in my police car by myself. I ask for a police car. You want a what? Yeah, I want a marked unit. So you have your car already? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's out there. We're going to, if you're real, we'll take you out. Ah, it's my therapy, man. I still you like being out there. I love being a cop, man. Feels I'm great to hit the streets. Oh, oh yeah. I, I Same just, thing with me, you know, as a reserve officer. I, you know, you're actually my boss because I'm a reserve Miami officer, well, you know, so. I'll tell you what, you you're going to get a, com a, not a commendable incident report. No. <laughs> you're going to get a written reprimand for being late today. I, I have to admit, it's the first time being out in traffic. I recorded my morning show today to be able to be here because the time was very early, nine in the morning. Too much information for everybody watching and listening, but we'll give you a little bit of the background. I forgot. Now people are driving after the pandemic and the lockdown. I forgot that. Miami had so much traffic. Uh, it took me an hour and a half to get here. Anyway, I got here. So my first impression with the chief was uh, a bad one. I was I was late. I'm oh, sorry, yeah, chief. I get my first uh, my first reprimand. Here, 
Uh, I think some of the Jack in the Box drive through. <laughs> We're gonna have to wait. We have our vaccinations for everybody. Yes, we've all been vaccinated and tested. Get your damn vaccinations, and you will be able to do this too. Get vaccinated. That's important to you. It's really important. Uh, your, my God. Your priorities uh, now as the new city of Miami police chief right now for this department. Well, first and foremost, it's to uh, assess internally what we've got going on. Uh, I, don't, I don't think departments, you don't know what you don't know, right? Again, uh, this is not my, this may be my last rodeo, but it's not my first rodeo. Right. This is my fir- fourth department, third that I've taken over from the outside. So I bring, I think, a, a, a different worldview, maybe a little broader uh, view. So we're going to be looking at everything internally to make sure that we are as efficient, as effective, and by the way, as uh, professional as we can be. And then we're going to work tirelessly to just build that trust, man. Because, look, when we build that trust, relational policing, the community is safer and the officers are safer. And that, to me, is a win. It's a win-win. So... Uh, we got a lot to do. I just looked at some shooting information on some of our shootings, and I'm not sure my people are working. You know, the shootings are happening at a certain time frame. We need to be working our crime fighting teams. So we're gonna be we're gonna be shaking it up a little bit, and uh, it's gonna be fun. I guarantee you this, and I guarantee my cops this: the day I leave here, the department will be in better shape than I found it. That's a guarantee.